and welcome to another biochemistry video lecture. This one is topic A1.2, nucleic acids. Our guiding questions for today, how does the structure of nucleic acids allow for heredity information to be stored? And how does the structure of DNA facilitate accurate replication? Our objectives, we are going to review some DNA structure. We're going to look at the structure of individual nucleotides in DNA and RNA. We're going to review condensations as they pertain to us making big polymers of nucleotides. We'll compare and contrast DNA and RNA, talk about complementary base pairing, and then we will explain the capacity of nucleic acids to store oh so much information. Remember that DNA is the genetic material of all living things, so us animals, we have DNA wrapped up in our nucleus, plant cells and bacterial cells and fungal cells, we all have DNA as our genetic material. Interestingly, even some non-living things non-living things like viruses also have nucleic acids to store some genetic information. Some of them have DNA and some of them have RNA, but even viruses have genetic information. And since we're talking about DNA and RNA, it's a good time for us to go ahead and review prokaryotic versus eukaryotic DNA. As always, BioNinja with the amazing mnemonic devices to help us remember some differences. DORA um, is our mnemonic device for remembering prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells. We're just going to focus on the DNA part for now. Remember that prokaryotic bacterial DNA is naked. It doesn't have any histones, as opposed to our eukaryotic DNA is wrapped around those histone proteins. The DNA in bacteria is circular. Our um, nuclear DNA is linear. We have introns bacteria do not. We'll talk about what those introns are a little bit later in the year. The monomers, or small individual pieces of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are nucleotides. Nucleotides are composed of three main components, a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Sometimes we draw super simplified versions of our nucleotides, and we just use a circle to represent the phosphate group. We use a pentagon to represent that sugar. It's a pentose sugar because it has five carbons. Remember that pent means five. That pentose sugar can be either ribose or deoxyribose. And then our nitrogenous base we represent in simplified form with this rectangle. If I wanted to zoom in and look a little bit more closely at the actual atoms in our nucleotides, here's our phosphate group bound to that five carbon sugar. Interestingly, the five carbons are not all in the pentagon. Carbon number one is here bound to our nitrogenous base. Carbon number two is here, carbon number three, carbon number four. Carbon number five is up here bound to the phosphate group. I can remember that because five and phosphate group both start with that f sound. So carbon number five, phosphate group. When I put all of these three pieces together, nitrogenous base and pentose sugar and phosphate group, I have a nucleotide. The sugar and phosphate groups of our nucleotides will combine to make what we call the backbones of RNA and DNA. So here we can see I've got my sugar, I've got a phosphate, I've got a sugar, I've got a phosphate, and these guys will combine to form, again, what we call the backbone. On the inside of that backbone, we have our nitrogenous bases. Those nitrogenous bases will hydrogen bond to each other in DNA to make our double strands. Our RNA doesn't do this double stranding quite as frequently as does the DNA. Most of the time, we'll find DNA as a double strand and RNA as a single strand. We could show this backbone also with a simplified version of our nucleotide diagrams. Remember that we like to draw, whoa, if I could draw a, a pentagon there, let me try again. This is why I teach science and not art. So here's our phosphate group. Here, we're trying again, is a slightly better pentagon. And attached to that pentagon is our rectangle because our circles represent phosphate groups. Our pentagons are those pentose sugars and our nitrogenous bases are the rectangles. I could draw the next nucleotide to make perhaps what we would call a dinucleotide by adding a pentagon to the phosphate group of this first nucleotide. And of course, this guy also has his phosphate group. And then I could draw attached to it yet another pentagon that has its phosphate group. And then we can throw those nitrogenous bases in here. And now I have a lovely polymer of this nucleotide nucleic acid piece. This, if I leave it single-stranded, I would call RNA. 
because RNA most often is found single stranded, just one piece, as opposed to DNA, which again, we usually find as a double strand. And when we make those dinucleotides, when we bind together those nucleotides to make uh, our polymers, it is just like with all of our other pieces of metabolism, a condensation reaction. So we're going to take a hydrogen off of the phosphate group. We're going to take this hydroxyl OH off of the pentose sugar. These guys will combine to make water, two H's and an O, and then this O will stick up onto that carbon and we form a bond. It is a special kind of covalent bond. Remember that covalent bonds are where we are sharing electrons, special kind of covalent bond called a phosphodiester bond. Um, it's because of the phosphate group, um, that double bonded oxygen in there. So why we call it phosphodiester. You don't necessarily need to know all those pieces of the organic chemistry, but do know that we have these special kinds of covalent bonds called phosphodiester bonds that hold together our nucleotides in both DNA and in RNA. Remember that we do love to count our carbons. So carbon number one is next to our nitrogenous base, carbon two, three, four, and carbon number five next to the phosphate group. This phosphate group is going to bind to the carbon number three of the next um, pentose sugar. So just when we get to replication, we're going to need to think about these carbons a lot. So start to put them into your brains now. Carbon number five with the phosphate group is going to bind to carbon number three of the nucleotide of the, the previous nucleotide. We have already mentioned some of the similarities and differences between RNA and DNA. We're going to go ahead and summarize those now all in one. So YR and YD, it's all about that pentose sugar. So RNA has a pentose sugar, that five carbon sugar, and it's called ribose. Ribose is one, two, three, four, five carbons in this pentagonal shape. If I take off of carbon number two, this hydroxyl group, and I cut the oxygen out, I literally deoxify it, then I end up with deoxyribose. So the only difference between these two sugars, ribose and deoxyribose, is that oxygen. So here I have OH, here I've taken the O off, literally deoxyed it to turn it into deoxyribose. So in DNA, deoxyribose is the sugar. In RNA, ribose is the sugar. We also have some different nitrogenous bases in RNA versus DNA. In DNA, we have T, C, A, N, G. You do need to know the whole entire names, not just the letters. DNA has thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. RNA has almost the same, except we're going to replace thymine with uracil. Cytosine, adenine, and guanine remain in RNA, but now we have uracil instead of thymine. And we've already mentioned that DNA most of the time is going to be in a double helix form, whereas RNA is more often single-stranded. It will sometimes still curve around a little bit, so maybe we could call it a single helix. Um, but most of the time we just say single-stranded versus double-stranded. I have two pieces of DNA that will stick together, those hydrogen bonds between those nitrogenous bases, whereas RNA most of the time we're going to find it in single-stranded form. Focusing here a little bit on that double-stranded DNA, complementary base pairing allows this double helix to form. We have hydrogen bonds that will form between what we call those complementary base pairs. The shapes of our bases, the adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, the shapes are just right that they like to match up with each other. So adenine and thymine will always pair together because their shapes allow for these hydrogen bonds to form. Same thing happens with cytosine and guanine. The shapes of them allow for these lovely hydrogen bonds to form. This specific base pairing allows us to make some beautiful copies of DNA when we need to go through cell division. It also allows us to use the code in DNA to make the perfect strands of messenger RNA so we can go and make those proteins when we need to. Again, adenine and thymine will always pair together, cytosine and guanine will always pair together, and this allows us to keep our codes super specific and to maintain the integrity, the, that specific sequence of our codes. 
So we're going to talk here just a little bit about the amazing variety that we can get out of our DNA sequences. So this is just a tiny little piece of the human insulin gene. And ignore that this is the same uh, code top and bottom. It's just a quirk of the database that I used to pull this information. Human insulin, the gene is 1,425 base pairs long. So, so if I'm talking about base pairs like C and G, complementary paired to each other is one base pair. So if I had like G, A, T, which would turn into C and T and A, this is three base pairs, one, two, three. Human insulin is over a thousand base pairs long, but insulin is actually a pretty small gene. The average human gene is 10 to 15 kilo base pairs long. That kilo is a thousand. So the average gene in us humans is 10,000 to 15,000 base pairs long. That's crazy. Let's say that I just wanted two base pairs. So that would be, I could pick G and then T, or I could pick C and then A, or I could pick whatever. I have four options here. I have four options here. So four times four is 16. 16-ish different combinations of just two base pairs. But what if I wanted 10? I wanted a sequence of 10 different A's, T's, C's, and G's. Then I would do four raised to the 10th power. That is over a million already. And that is the different number of sequences of A's, T's, C's, and G's I can put together if I want a, a sequence that is 10 base pairs long. Insulin is 1,425 base pairs long. So if I wanted to see how many different forms of DNA sequences could I put together that were the same length as the insulin gene, that would be four raised to the 1,425th power. And I plug that into my calculator and my TI says overload. That number is too big for my calculator. Imagine if I tried to do four raised to the 10,000th power. Oh my goodness, the amazing diversity that we can plug into our DNA sequences is huge. We are able to store an enormous amount of information in our DNA because we have so many different options, not just for the lengths of our sequences, 1,400 to 15,000, but also in the order of the A's, T's, C's, and G's that we put into our sequences. And are you ready for your mind to be blown? Oh my goodness. So each of our human chromosomes, if we were to stretch it out, so pull it away from its histone proteins and stretch it out, it would be about five centimeters long. That's huge. If we were to take all of our chromosomes out of our cell, out of just one cell, and line them up in like a line of DNA, we would end up with two meters of DNA in each and every one of our cells. That's crazy. And that DNA is wrapped up into these tiny little nuclei. Two meters is just like all, all over here. And we are able to do that because DNA is super, super skinny, crazy, crazy long, but really skinny. And so we can wrap it around itself, bind it up with those histone proteins, and we can pack it up into the nucleus pretty efficiently. If we were to take, here's where, where things get crazy. If you were to take all of the DNA in all of the cells of your body and put them into one crazy long line of DNA, it would actually cross the diameter of our solar system twice. That's how much DNA is in your body. Crazy. So a lot of our DNA is conserved, which means that it is saved from, from one organism to another. And again, this just kind of helps us to understand how different organisms are related. This is the same image that we had in our protein lecture, where we were talking about how the amino acid sequences of this protein is cytochrome C. Those amino acid sequences in our proteins can sometimes be conserved or we can save them from one organism to the next. The reason that our proteins are similar is because the DNA is also similar. So a lot of the DNA in different organisms is conserved or kept the same from one organism to the next. This amazing graphic kind of gives us an overview of how similar humans are to other organisms. So us humans, we are genetically 99.9% .9 all the same. It's just 0.1% different. 
of a difference in our DNA that makes us different from one to the other, which is amazing that we have so much diversity within us humans, and it's based on only 0.1% of a, a genetic difference. But we're also super similar to lots of other organisms. So we're 90% the same DNA as cats, 60% the same as fruit flies and bananas. So it's really pretty fabulous how similar we are to other organisms because a lot of our DNA is going to be conserved. And on that note, my friends, we have arrived at the end of our video lecture. We talked about how the structure of nucleic acids allows for information to be stored, and we talked about how that amazing complementary base pairing in our DNA will allow it to do what it needs to do when we talk about replication and then also transcription and translation when we make our proteins. We reviewed DNA structure. We talked about those different pieces of nucleotides, the phosphate groups, the pentose, sugars, the nitrogenous bases. We looked at how condensation reactions can put nucleotides together to make our polymers of DNA and RNA, which have some similarities and some differences. We talked about that complementary base pairing, adenine and thymine will pair, cytosine and guanine will pair, and we talked about, oh my goodness, how much information we can hold in our DNA and RNA to pass on our genetic information. Good work today.